the question, however, is what uh, is uh, achievable in practice, what can be uh, used, and uh, in which way can we go forward with these uh, improvements. And uh, we have here Martin Richards from Dolby Labs. Uh, Martin is chief architect uh, cinema at Dolby Labs, uh, where he works on imaging products for the cinema business group. Since joining Dolby in 1986, he has been involved in the design of a number of products, including Dolby Digital Sound on Film, Dolby Digital Cinema, Dolby 3D and High Dynamic Range, Dolby Cinema Projection. Prior to Dolby, Marty worked at Ampex uh, in the optical signal processing section of the R&D department and in the data systems group, working on high density optical and magnetic recorders. In 2007, Marty received an Ampex SciTech award for commentation for conversion of film from silver base to cyan dye tracks. In 2010, he received the Lumiere award for the Dolby 3D system and so on. I will not uh, list all of the awards. Uh, I think we are very happy that you are here and uh, uh, would uh, like to hear your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, as you mentioned, I'm Marty Richards, and along with uh, Barrett Lippi, Pete Van Kessel, and Dave Chanelli, we made a series of measurements in theaters to assess the performance of Dolby Vision and DCI projectors in different venues. In addition to the contrast ratio, I came up with sort of a simple model that's incorporated into the equation that we have later uh, that allows us to compare the results in the theaters with a model that's based on parameters that you can measure in a theater that's not the contrast. So we also considered the properties of typical cinematic content to understand how the content uh, affects what the image looks like. In other words, what the contrast ratio that we get on scene. So we've seen that, uh, you know, images with low ambient light and low room reflection, you know, can look pretty amazing with a Dolby Vision projector. Um, and it's a, you know, high dynamic projector, but there's no easy way to say, well, what will look good? There's no good metric of saying, this projector will look good because it has a certain contrast. So instead of trying to do that, uh, I think it's futile to try to come up with a single number. I think we need to have a, a number of numbers. Just like with audio, you don't have a single number that says, oh, the distortion is something or another, so therefore it's going to sound great. So our approach was to measure and calculate dark levels as a function of the average picture level. Uh, we know that room reflections and veiling glare, projection veiling glare are functions of how much light goes through the projector. And so we um, measured the contrast ratio of these four corner test patterns that you can see like, like below. We have a whole series of them that get smaller and smaller. Start outs with a 25% area number, we call it a 50% test pattern because it, this, as a block in the center would occupy uh, halfway, 50% the width and 50% the height. So there are a number of factors affecting the dark luminance, what, what's left on the screen. And uh, these are the full screen projector dark level, so that's essentially what you would measure if you were measuring sequential contrast of the projector. We have the ambient light of the room, which is pretty bad in this room, I think. Uh, and we have factors that are related or functions of the APL. And these are veiling glare from the optics, so scattering in the optics, the mirrors, the port glass, uh, light reflected back from the room and audience to the screen, and uh, those are, those are the main factors we have. Now these can be grouped into projector-related factors and uh, room-related factors, and, and it's useful to do that. So projector factors, the peak luminance. How bright, in our case, do you turn the lasers up? Okay, how, how bright is the image? It's 48 nits for a GCI projector. We use 108 nits. You could also envision systems that go up to 1,000 or 
Uh, so it's an important number to consider. The uh, projector dark luminance is, as I said, is what you would measure if you were measuring sequential contrast. Now, I prefer to express it as the peak luminance divided by the sequential contrast because that puts uh, us in a situation later when we look at the equation where we can adjust the peak level and make uh, simulations as to what would happen if I just turned the projector up to 1,000 nits, what kind of contrast ratio would I get in a particular room, for example. So it just makes it a little more uh, easier to use in terms of independence. The LDDLP is the projector level dependent dark luminance, supposed to be, sorry about that. And this is, this is the, the term that's associated with the veiling glare, essentially, caused by the scattering in the optical surfaces. I call it veiling glare, even though it's not to do with our eyes, it's projector veiling glare. So it's basically dependent upon how much light's going through the projector. Um, so you get the equation, uh, excuse me a second. You get the equation, contrast ratio equals the peak luminance divided by the dark luminance uh, which is like for the sequential contrast, and the level-dependent dark luminance. So I'm going to continue um, expanding this just a little bit on the projector side. Pretty soon we'll get to the graphs. Um, so the level-dependent dark luminance is a function of the APL, and we wanted to use a single parameter and put into the model instead of having to have some kind of... Uh, lookup table or something. So we measured the contrast ratio of the projector by <clears throat> pointing a um, incident meter that was in an anti-reflection tube at the projection lens. Okay, So we're not measuring anything in the room, we're measuring just the projector itself. And then we <coughs> Um, put these corner box test patterns through and took a number of measurements uh, on a number of projectors. What we found is we got a, a straight line curve as the area uh, re was reduced, but it wasn't a linear curve. It wasn't proportional to the light. It had a gamma factor. And we think that's caused by the fact that these uh, corner box test patterns don't maintain the same distance between the boxes and the center point. They get further away and that reduces the MTF. So uh, as we get with lower light levels or lower APLs, the, the pieces are further apart and it has a little bit steeper than one curve. Uh, and we also found that the veiling glare of the DCI projector and the Dolby Vision projector are very similar. In fact, I don't see much difference at all. Uh, you can affect the veiling glare in the DCI projector and the Dolby Vision projector by cleaning the optics. You know, I mean, it's really important to keep the port glass clean. It's really important to keep the lens clean. And those can make a quite significant difference. So overall, we get this projector contrast ratio uh, shown in the equation. So this is the curves that we, measurements we took uh, for the, a couple of uh, projectors. One was a DCI projector. One was a Dolby Vision projector that we had cleaned the heck out of and, and made as perfect as we possibly could. Most of the Dolby Vision projectors follow closer along what the DCI curve is, and some of them are significantly lower. Um, let me check my room. So what happens here is that for high APLs, you're dominated by the veiling glare, OK? Uh, for lower APLs, on the DCI projector, you can see that sort of the flat line. So that is the uh, dark level of the projector. And on the Dolby Vision projector, you see up in the far very top, there's a little bit of a curve coming out, and that's the uh, uh, dark level for the Dolby Vision projector. 
the uh, I have to say these measurements are somewhat difficult to take and to do it correctly you need to generate a DCP that has an alternating pattern so that you can actually uh, get the measurement for the uh, DCI projector out of the noise so the other problem with this these measurements is yes they're difficult to take under easy conditions but in a room like this for example you either need to put the the meter way up there in the center of the screen or go, you, it doesn't have to be at the screen, it can be further back or go fairly close to the lens and they're just difficult to take those measurements in a, in a real environment. It's one of the reasons we use the model in, in a couple of cases to derive, sort of back derive what the, uh, the numbers were. So let's talk about the room factors. We have the ambient dark luminance, so that's the ambient light that you normally measure off the screen. Uh, and we have the room de level dependent dark luminance. Again, this is uh, proportional to the projected luminance in the projector. It's a single parameter is what we want, so we can put it in the model. Um, we find that a way that is sort of traditional to measure the room reflectance is to put a white screen up and then put a film can up, that's the old way, and then measure behind the film can with an incident meter and, and you can detect the percentage of light that is reflected from the walls back to the meter. And that's great except if you have a uh, gain screen then you don't get as much light coming back as you would have if you had a uh, white screen. So if you measure off the screen instead of at, with the incident meter, then this SG term that's in, in here uh, is, is no longer relevant you, because the light that you measure is measured from the screen. So that's, sometimes we do that and sometimes we don't. So the system contrast ratio. Um, you put the equation together and you get this, this long hairy thing. Uh, and this is the projector peak luminance. I'll, I'll read out what the terms sort of are in, in actual fact. You get the peak luminance of the projector, the dark luminance of the, uh, divided by the dark luminance of the projector, the veiling glare of the projector, the ambient light in the room, and the reflected light from the room. So that's the, carry, the, the contrast ratio of the system. So we took a bunch of measurements with these four corner test box uh, patterns and I think we used five or six venues and we found that yeah, the model and the, and the data match pretty well and we can use this equation to calculate, <coughs> excuse me, the room reflectance and the veiling glare from contrast measurement data. So you don't necessarily need to go in and measure the room reflectance. You don't necessarily need to go in and measure the veiling glare number from a projector. If you have the plots, you can put those, adjust those numbers in the model until it matches the plot. And we found that there's pretty good agreement between when you actually measure them and when you do it that way. So. Uh, we've used the model that way, so we, in some theaters it's really difficult, as I said, to measure the veiling glare. So theaters, so um, we did it in a number of different places. Uh, the very dark room is a, a lab at, it's called the Neary Studio in Dolby Laboratories, where, where I put uh, black blankets on things and I um, you know, made sure all the lights were completely off so it was dark as possible. And then we went through and cleaned the optics as much as we possibly could, cleaned the lens, cleaned the port glass, cleaned the mirrors, and pretty much got it as perfect as we could. So it represents the ideal Dolby Vision projector. Uh, you can see that the ambient light is very low, it's got good VG ratio, and it has a uh, low room reflection. Venue number one is a DCI projector in a similar kind of room, it's a very dark room, but not quite as dark. I didn't go and put blankets all over the place. 
but it really hardly matters because the DCI projector has such a uh, large dark level. Venue two um, had a pretty bad ambient ambient situation. And otherwise, it was pretty normal. Venue three was uh, had a had a dirty projector and not a very good ambient light situation. So that's kind of an example of a pretty a crummy theater, but one that, that might be out there in the U.S. Um, number five, four had a moderately dirty projector. In other words, these sites were all sites that had been playing film for you know months and months, and, and you find out that, oh, in actual fact, people don't clean off the port glass every month or two. They leave it until it gets filthy. Uh, and it has a sort of a normal ambient light for a US uh, cinema. Um, number five was a screening room, um, a large screening room. And it had uh, sort of well, pretty good performance all the way around. It had low ambient light, especially. Um, and this is more representative of some of the European sites as well. The Dolby Cinema European PLF theaters tend to have darker levels than the U.S. ones, and partly that's because of the way the lights are done on the stairs. It's mostly the stair lighting problem. We think that you can have a uh, light level that's in this area, in Venue 5, in uh, a theater and still meet all of the uh, safety regulations, but it takes a little different lighting situation than the stair lights that you know, are especially the ones that are, um, you know, have the little rails where the light, lights actually mounted on, this, on the stairs themselves. That tends to create sort of a runway effect. So this is the data itself. Um, there are a lot of graphs here. I left the veiling glare um, lines up there, and you can see that they you know, have a slightly steeper slope than the slopes of the measurements. And that's because the measurements have the room reflection in, and the room reflection is uh, proportional to the light level in the room, essentially. It's not, there's no gamma in that curve. Um, so the stars represent the actual data points that we took with the measured this with the PR740, and the lines represent what the model suggested we would get, and you can see that they are pretty close match. Um, so. And high, high APLs off to the right, the systems are all limited by the uh, veiling glare of the projector and the room reflection. More room reflection than veiling glare, but uh, that's where, where our limits are. As you start moving to the left, you start becoming limited, in the case of the DCI projector, by its own dark luminance, uh, or its sequential contrast, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, or the ambient light in the room, okay? For the HDR projector, it's, it's all, most all ambient light. You're, you're hardly getting into the projector itself. Okay, so um, what this is saying is that if you have low APLs, an HDR projector is offers a tremendous Im improvement. For high APLs, it's not so significant. So, can we take advantage of this uh, improved contrast? I mean, we're showing that we actually measured these kind of contrasts, you know, 300,000, 400,000 to one in, in the theater, um, and can we take advantage of those? 
So we analyzed nine Dolby Vision graded movies and calculated the cumulative APL distribution of this content. From the data, we can determine the number of frames that were dark or had large areas that were dark. Uh, I think we should note that the DCI grade and the Dolby Vision grade tend to have similar absolute APLs in terms of the light on the screen. So when normalized, this results in a lower calculated percent APL with the Dolby Vision grade than for a normal DCI grade by about a factor of two. <clears throat> so when I say it, I, I, the plot I'm, the cumulative plot was for Dolby Vision grades. And so if you plotted the uh, things for DCI grades, they would have higher APLs in, in, in general. <clears throat> What this seems to be, this is caused by, is that when the cinematographer or the, the grader grades the movie, they, they keep the mid-levels at about the same level, even with a Dolby Vision projector. And the, the reason they do that is they want to have highlights that are brighter, not necessarily have the overall picture just get brighter. So this is an interesting graph. So this <clears throat> shows on the right with the uh, blue line, excuse me, I'm having a hard time with this, the um, cumulative distribution of the movies. Now we had nine movies since done a, a number more and they just, just all fall sort of on the same line. It doesn't really affect this line much. So I suspect if we did, you know, 40 different movies, we would have the same distribution here. Uh, a point on this curve represents the location that includes all of the frames to the left of that point, okay? So if I describe some of this, 95% uh, of the frames have an APL that is less than 25%. So if you go off to the right and look at that line up there and go to 0.95, and you go down, cross over to that blue line, and go down, you'll see that it's about the 25% point. So uh, half of the frames have APLs that are less than 3%. So that's the median. So if you go to the 0.5, right over there, it's 3%. And 10% of the frames, or like 10 minutes of the movie, uh, have APLs of less than 0.3%. So there's a significant part of the movie where you spend, uh, you know, at very low APLs, and it's not just the credits. In fact, the credits don't tend to have as low APLs as you would expect because there's quite a bit of white light on there as the credits go rolling through. Um, the red curves show three different projectors uh, in in the same venue, essentially. So I use the model to to um, simulate this. So the first one is a Dolby Vision projector. The one on top is a Dolby Vision projector in venue five. Uh, the one that's down below is a, is a Dolby Vision projector in DCI emulation mode. And this has a 5,000 to one contrast ratio. And the bottom one was the uh, DCI projector in the same room. So all of these are, you know, are in the same room. You can see the kind of different performances you get. So this is uh, an image from Flirting with Fire. Boy, it doesn't show up very well up here. Looks fine on my screen down here, though. Uh, the, uh, this frame has uh, a, a low APL but it has a pretty high peak luminance. The luminance in that flame, the highest part, is about 48 nits. Uh, about 5% of all the frames in a typical movie have an APL of this value or lower. The uh, detail is clearly visible, uh, you know, around her waist and other areas. Uh, which wouldn't be the case in the, you know, if you tried to run this with a DCI projector or something. But the overall uh, APL of this movie is, you know, it's still pretty low, 0.14%. Or about 
0.2 nits. A little bit less. The, this is a movie scene from North by Northwest, uh, Mount Rushmore. Um, this, I have a histogram for this I'll show later. But you can see, if you look at this image, try to remember it, it has a lot of areas that are, you know, almost black, okay? Uh, and it's overall just a very dark scene. So this is the histogram. So the vertical lines represent the number of pixels that, oops, I'm running low on time, uh, the number of pixels that are at that level. The peak level is at three and a half nits. The APL was about 0.06 nits. Uh, and the median was almost off to the edge, so there's a lot of dark pixels. So not all scenes have, have high peak levels. So I'll show this graph, I'll skip to this. What I did was I took the corner box test and I decreased the level of the, the white portions. Uh, so I started with a really dark, dark area and got, got brighter. So I started with dark ones on the left. And as I get brighter, I get the contrast ratio improves. Um, it improves until it starts to hit the area where the reflectance and the veiling glare of the projector becomes significant. And that's what shows the sort of tail over side at, at, at the right hand side of the curves. So as you increase the brightness of those corner box test patterns, at some point they get bright enough where the room reflection uh, overcomes the ambience the, and then you start flattening out and you can't get an increase anymore. And you notice the DCI projector is way down and that's because of its, its own dark luminance. So, so in conclusion, um, if the projected light is low, then the veiling glare and the room reflection will also be low and play a less significant factor in the system performance. With an HDR projector, the system performance is limited by the room ambient light. And most movies have low APLs or low peak levels or a combination of both and can take advantage of the HDR performance with contrast ratios greater than a million to one. That's all I have. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, do we have questions in the room? Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, great presentation, Marty. Very important work. I think this is uh, important for the industry. I did have one question. Um, I think that what you presented very much matches with previous research. Pretty similar. Yeah, let's, let's look back at that. Good. And uh, my question is that um, previous research has indicated that the audience uh, contributes very much to that room reflection, including skin albedo and clothing reflection. Are you proposing that we mostly play high contrast films to empty auditoriums, or have you looked at <laughs> Isn't that what we do now? Uh, no. It, it, I did. I did did do that, make that measurement. Um, if you look at venue five here with the audience, okay, so you can see all of the people. Uh, it's mostly full. That's a 300 so seat auditorium. And it does decrease the contrast ratio. Uh, and in fact, these lines would all go down by, the, the, the red ones would go down by about 25%. So we found that if you made the contrast measurements with, the, uh, with no audience and then put the audience in there and made the contrast ratio measurement, it went down by about 25% along that sloped curve. Once, once you started going up and hitting the ambient light of the, the room, then you know it, it, that didn't match. But good question. Okay. Yeah. Um, is your measurement of HDL done simply as a, a simple arithmetic mean for all the pixels in the frame, or do you use some sort of geometric mean? 
No, it's an arithmetic mean of the luminance values of all of the images. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Into front. One thing I, I think you should mention: this look, look at this theater here, and if there's any exhibitors here, uh, what are the color of those seats? And of course, what are the color of your seats in the picture, black? Yeah. And red walls. <clears throat> the other thing is the light, the light color of the uh, stair lighting and stuff. You know, it was, it would also be nice if that was not, and a, you know, like red is a is shows up as being red on the screen. Blue shows up as being blue on the screen. So it's it's hard to to say, oh, don't put any color in those lights, make them white or gray or something. But that would be the ideal situation. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, so any other question? Yeah, Bill? Early in the talk, you spoke of the MCF of the varying size of the corner boxes right. as perhaps affecting the measurement to some degree. You could go with the same size corner boxes in all cases, but then actually darken the individual corner so that your ACL varies, but your MCF is constant. Right, and that is kind of what that final curve that I showed would would show, um, and that I mean that's a it's you know I took these measurements I didn't know what I was going to get the results I was going to get, and I made a number of measurements and uh, I used this because it was a convenient pattern to use, and I think if if I was going to you know redo this. Uh, I might try to come up with a different pattern that, that doesn't change the MTF as much so that we wouldn't have that extra curve. Although that, that does seem to be, uh, it's convenient, it helps separate the room reflection from the veiling glare when all you have is the contrast measurements. So, okay. Okay, so last question on the top. Uh, standards, oh boy. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think at the, at the moment we've been operating in the, in the realm of discovery. We don't know exactly what's important and what isn't important. And we're starting to get an understanding of that. But uh, I think maybe when we get a better understanding, we might consider, you know, what kind of things we could standardize for, for having the kind of performance that we know we can get. But at the moment, I think we're not there yet. <laughs>